Welcome to our speaker series for leading STEAM educators and school leaders. My name is Chris Bennett. I'm so pleased to be hosting this series that is focused on the challenges that are facing K-12 school leaders in preparing young learners for the fields of tomorrow. Today's session is titled, How Can We Design for Learning? And I'm pleased to shortly introduce you to our guest, Glenn Fajardo. Before I introduce Glenn, I would like to introduce myself and share briefly about Digital Media Academy. My name is Chris Bennett. I'm a longtime video game designer and an affiliate at Stanford, Stanford Graduate School of Education. I'm also the engagement specialist at Digital Media Academy. Digital Media Academy was founded in 1999 on the campus of Stanford University, and we provide comprehensive K-12 STEAM curriculum and consultation services to global schools and education leaders. Digital Media Academy's leading STEAM schools program provides curriculum covering six subject areas, computer science, engineering, music and media, digital art, business, and game development. The speaker series is brought to you by the leading STEAM schools team and is available globally through the Digital Media Academy schools community. So why are we here? This series aims to connect you with the leading thinkers and change makers to unlock the tools and knowledge needed to lead K-12 education change. Without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Glenn Fajardo, our guest for today's session. Glenn lectures at the Stanford D School, and he's a former director of co-design practice at TechSoup Global Network. Glenn connects to create, exploring how can we be how we can be creative together when we are far apart in a different cultural context. Among his popular courses is Design for Learning, co-designing for connection and community, where students practice the design abilities of learning from others, navigating ambiguity, synthesizing information, and experimenting rapidly. I would like to invent Glenn, invite Glenn to join me on screen. Hey, Chris. Hey, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us uh, today. So tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you come to be here? Yeah, it is a it's it's a funny journey. I uh, I was hanging out with some students after uh, we we completed our winter quarter class, and they asked me uh, kind of how I got from here to there. And I told them that when I was sixteen, I thought I had my life figured out. Um, I thought like, okay, I'm going to work on like a super like socially impactful problem, and that problem is going to be around energy, and I'm going to become a nuclear fusion scientist. And and uh, uh, do that and research that for like forty years, um, and then uh, very long story short, like uh, one thing kind of led to another. In when I was in university, and on the verge of accepting a um, an internship to a, a laboratory, and then realizing that um, I probably would be working on uh, weapons research that summer, I was kind of like, ah, I just can't can't do that path, and ended up going through. Um, uh, like an exploration through uh, looking at the larger public policy environment around technology, uh, going to graduate school in public policy, uh, having a career like in, in government and in social venture startups and in uh, um, social enterprise nonprofits. And when I was in social enterprise nonprofits, I was working with uh, um, a global network of uh, innovators around the world and trying to figure out like how can we best uh, kind of harness our collective creativity and um, kind of got uh, um, tuned into like the, the methods of the, the D school. Uh, very long story short, uh, I happened to be sitting next to a friend of a friend at a birthday party. And then the next day she asked me, hey, do you want to teach a class together at the D school? And I said, sure, why not? And, uh, and then fast forward uh, nine years, I'm still part of the D school teaching community. Um, I, my, I've co-led courses such as design for learning, uh, co-design and connection and community, um, and then uh, also the design across borders uh, series and the reimagining campus life series. And uh, super happy to be here and uh, to, to be uh, sharing time with you today. Thank you so much. Uh, let's jump into some questions. So classrooms have looked pretty similar for the past fifty years, um, you know, and we know from stepping into the the D school <clears throat> that classrooms can look quite a bit different. But for, for people around the world, how different do you think a classroom can really look in, in the 21st century compared to what we think is kind of normal with the tables and the chairs and the teacher lecturer up front? How can, different can it really look? Yeah, I think I, could, I think it can look um, extremely different. Uh, I, I'll start with 
Uh, it's kind of funny to think, to put it in perspective, that we now have college graduates in the workforce who were born in the 21st century. Uh, that, that, that's kind of, so we're, we're, we're kind of at, 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 at an interesting point in time. And I think sometimes when people talk about this question, it's framed in terms of technology, particularly kind of high tech kind of things. And I think that is certainly useful. And we can talk a little bit more particularly about like artificial intelligence and how that's going to change things. Uh, but I, I find it helpful to reframe this first in terms of what are the kinds of interactions that we want in the classroom? Like what are the set of interactions that we want? Uh, what are the, what's the set of kind of feelings that we want to create in a classroom? So I think about things like how do we create like uh, belonging and safety? Like how do we create uh, relevance of the material to the students' lived experience? How do we uh, help students feel valued? And how, how do we help people uh, feel like accountable to themselves and to each other? So uh, to your question about like how different a classroom can look, uh, let's just kind of contrast, uh, compare and contrast like what, what people may be used to and then uh, kind of a slightly different model. Um, in a lot of classrooms, you have the, the instructor is speaking for you know, like 80 to 90% of the time, there are empirical studies that kind of look at um, like talk time and stuff like that. Um, but what if we look at it instead as weaving together a shared narrative of how students are like constructing knowledge and kind of taking what they learn and starting to kind of build things with that. So imagine that we start with um, like the, the classroom enters and then we start with a kind of a transition in exercise where people you know, their, their minds are elsewhere, but then we have kind of this focusing exercise, kind of a icebreaker or um, a kind of a ritual in. Then we pose like a challenge, uh, like an opening challenge. So imagine this as like the first two to three minutes of like um, an episode on Netflix, right? There's kind of a story problem that's introduced. And then the main characters in that story are the students, right? So there's like a challenge and there's kind of that suspense. And then like, there's something that's kind of relevant, but like challenging and achievable. Uh, then students get kind of their toolkits and like material to work with kind of things that, that they'll have like in their journey to make sense of, of, of the, 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 the story problem for today. And then the learning experience is mostly students uh, talking to each other and kind of working with each other to create something. And then everyone shares something uh, somewhere. And then everyone has an audience for what they share and is able to get feedback on what they do. And then it leads into like the next thing. Um, now, what I've described is, is basically how a lot of, I run my own classes at the G School and it kind of comes to be more like a, a reality TV show. Um, and it, if you don't mind, Chris, I'd like to show like a quick clip from like what the, the beginning of the, the show or said, because I think it's, it's easier to kind of wrap your head around it with, with an example. Uh, so just to set uh, a little bit of um, context for this, this was the season finale of my classroom winter quarter, which is called Negotiation by Design. And it has kind of like a seasonal recap. Uh, and I'm going to stop it like as it gets into some of the introductions, but uh, 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 let's go ahead and, and roll the clip. How helpful the empathy map was. Understanding the resources that I have in times of uncertainty. Okay, I'm going to pause it there, but that kind of gives you an idea of how we set up the idea of each um, each class session is like an episode, and it links into like an, an overall series. And the important part here is that 
the students are the protagonists in the story. And like what is created in the class is from the students' knowledge, but we provide enough structure in which that that happens and that we were able to meet the learning objectives of that class. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, it, it does. And it's it's super exciting too, because when we think sometimes about what a classroom looks like in the 21st century, the assumption is bigger video screens, more technology, which is is great. But what you're saying is instead of just adding technology, we're adding the right amount of structure to open up and empower students, if I'm hearing that right. That, that's correct. And th there's a lot of both uh, story dynamics and game dynamics, uh, which, which uh, Chris, you and I could have a separate discussion on the game dynamics of it. But it really involves like how we can um, kind of tap into the students' curiosity and their sense of play and their sense of making something of something, right? It's less about like knowledge transfer or like them uh, learning kind of skills that are highly codified. And it's more about how they can bring themselves and their own originality into something, especially in an age of uh, 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 more and more AI. Uh, knowledge that is highly codified, honestly, like that is things that AI is going to be doing better anyway. And I'd rather focus our students on the human skills that are going to be enduring and really like, um, it, it's an exciting time because I think we'll be able to focus on those things more so than than in the past. We'll kind of have to. Right. And, and talking about students interacting with each other, this leads into the, the next question, which is, Kind of understanding that our us as humans we're fundamentally social and that's yeah. true obviously for students in a classroom how do we actually engineer a classroom to make it more social and and have it more likely that students can have interesting uh, interesting interactions with each other yeah that's a great uh, great question um i think one one uh, little piece i'd like to plant is it's important to understand a little bit about the human brain and that humans are actually fundamentally social and what that what that means kind of on a on a on a on brain science level uh for a really great in-depth look at this uh, i recommend the book uh, uh social by matthew lieberman at ucla uh but as, as one kind of key concept from the book you can imagine that the um i actually don't have to imagine it. This, is, this is kind of what what the, the science says is that there's kind of two general parts of the brain, if you kind of, if you roughly look at it, one is our kind of rational and analytical side. And then the other side is our social side of our brain. And those two things kind of act as um, what uh, Matthew Lieberman calls a neural seesaw. Like we're either thinking kind of more kind of rationally and analytically, or we're thinking more socially. Part of what's interesting is that our default, like given um, no uh, kind of forces applied to it, um, our default is actually to think socially, right? And so education kind of focuses very heavily on kind of the rational and analytical side. And so we can kind of rephrase this to say, like, how can education activate both the rational and analytical side and the social side of, of, of how we learn? So I think uh, one example I'd like to kind of uh, build from is kind of what happened with breakout rooms during the pandemic like in, in, in Zoom. So for instructors that have used breakout rooms, uh, you might have very mixed experiences around this, like where for some people like breakout rooms were the thing that kind of uh, kept them sane during the, uh, the, the height of the pandemic. Uh, for other people, like to this day, they like hate being put into breakout rooms. And it, so the interesting question is like, why? why, why is that? And I think what's important is to have a few principles of how we can structure social experiences in, in learning uh, that give people a higher um, probability of success in those, those interactions. So number one is to keep the groups really small. Like I think two, three, or four people max, I think is a really uh, critical starting point. When you, when you put people into groups of like seven or eight or so, um, uh, whether it's uh, on Zoom or in person, um, what you end up having is one or two people talking and everybody else kind of like um, uh, not contributing. So I think I think that's the, the first thing. The second thing is you have to give people something to do together. Like you have to give them kind of like a like a kind of a collective enterprise that they're doing in that activity, uh, and it has to be a little bit more specific than say like uh, discuss this. Like discuss isn't really. Um, you're not really like having any kind of implied objective in that or any kind of shared objective uh, between the group. So having something that you have to do together, some kind of uh, modest objective 
it could be really simple. It could be like, hey, come up with uh, you know three examples of uh, why the American Revolution was misunderstood in Europe or something like that. Um, I think it's important to make sure that everyone in the group has a role, like that everybody is uh, kind of responsible and that everybody's contributions are visible in what's being done. So I think it's it's important to have both that kind of that um, the thing that the group is creating together, but for everyone to be able to see themselves in what what the group creates. And then the last thing is, uh, and, and I think this is the thing that where a lot of Zoom breakout rooms and other uh, small group activity in general kind of breaks down, is you have to scaffold the first moves. You have to scaffold like what people start with and how they kind of get started in the first, uh, you know, uh, one or two minutes of what they're doing at, in a small group to make sure that they're uh, not kind of just staring at each other for 10 minutes and like awkwardly uh, uh, sitting there in silence. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, it does. And it really makes me think these um, kind of two different parts of the brain, the rational and the social, and how our default is to think socially. But sometimes in a classroom, we need to think rationally um, to solve problems, take in information. How do we shift between rational and social in a, in a classroom? Are, are there ways to, to kind of mechanically for, for instructors to do that? Yeah, I think I think there there are. That's a great question, and I think there are actually several ways to uh, for instructors to do that. Like, one is kind of the example that that I I gave with kind of doing things like in small group work. But I think you can also think about uh, let's let's think about uh, the American Revolution, just as what what one one example. I mean, it could be the revolution in any any or like any any event in any any country. Uh, but I'll, I'll say the American Revolution as an example. Um, a lot of times we'll focus on kind of the, the facts of what happened and say like, you know, this is when, you know, the Boston Tea Party happened or, or you know, X, Y, and Z. Uh, but we don't really think about the social psychological dimensions of it. We don't think about like, you know, what was, what was George Washington thinking? Like we don't think about, that's also kind of a form of social thinking about putting yourself in the place of like another person and like what they might've been thinking or feeling. So there's all these interesting um, kind of social dramas in various subjects. I mean, history is a, a kind of a more obvious example of it, but you could also imagine this for um, like uh, like physics, like where how how people kind of came across discoveries or like how um, you know X, Y, or Z uh, kind of discovery happened. But thinking about like how did humans think through this, and then how do you, student, like you know how how would how would you uh, what do you make of this? And what might you uh, create with us? Does, does that make sense, Chris? Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying by taking the subject matter and adding the right amount of context um, and inviting student thought gives us that flow between rational and social, but but keeps it feeling natural and in the flow of the class and not like now we're doing an exercise, now we're doing group work, now you're going to listen. Right. That, that, that's that's correct. It's 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 more of a uh, it, it's more of a thing that is kind of weaved together in a as you said like a natural kind of organic way. And I think the key thing is the social layer uh, creates like the sense of relevance. Uh, instead of having kind of these rational and analytical things that are kind of divorced from um, uh, kind of social relevance, it's kind of weaved together as as you described. And in that way, you have a reason to kind of learn learn something. Where um, if if I'm learning, um, say like the fundamental theorem of calculus, which uh, I, I actually strangely enough I was, I was trying to relearn it like about uh, three or four weeks ago with, with a, a, a friend of mine who is um, a, a math PhD, and what struck me about that that conversation was um, she, she, she's also a really really good tutor. Like uh, she kind of presented it in all these terms of like why I should care about each thing or like why each step is kind of fascinating. And we got through, like I always understood it like on a computational level, but getting it, tapping into that sort of curiosity and relevance made it stick a lot more. And I look back at my own education when I was younger, where there are so many things I learned. Um, I mean, I got through it, you know, I did, I did well in school, um, checked all the boxes, um, but there are so many things where, um, I think particularly like my undergrad, we were around uh, like some of the quantum physics work where uh, I got, again, got through the classes, like my grades said I did well, but I didn't kind of really have that intuition and grasp of things. And I think that's what we can really help our students with so that they're, they're understanding things uh, 
um, beyond a mechanical level and they're really developing kind of like intuitions of the world and being able to, to do that in ways that they find relevant and impactful and interesting. So this leads me to an, another question that, that I wanted to talk about. Engagement is, is a big problem in most classrooms and what you're describing to me is getting students involved, getting their buy-in, getting their trust. Mm -hmm. But it's also, um, sometimes we give students small stakes of things to work on. Um, are we giving students big enough challenges in class? Yeah, that, that, is, that is a great question. Like it is, it, this idea of like, are we giving students big enough challenges? I think, I wonder if we can reframe it a little bit. And, and what I mean by that is, instead of thinking of it as just sort of big, small, uh, think about like, um, kind of like, what are the components of a compelling challenge? Like what, what are the, the different like elements of it? So one is, um, which I mentioned before, is kind of this idea of uh, why this is relevant to you. Like if it's not connecting like from a relevant standpoint uh, for a, a young student or really anyone, I think, I think that is the, the idea of relevance is something that we often kind of overlook. We just kind of assume that people should, should, should be interested in this. Um, I think another thing is this idea of crafting um, the level of desirable difficulty, right? You want it to be uh, in, 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 a, in a, Chris is like, like right up your, uh, very much your alley in terms of like crafting that idea of a uh, difficulty that is, um, it's not easy, uh, but, it it kind of leaves you right on your toes where you feel like you could do it, you know, or that it's kind of within reach that or you might succeed. Um, I think that's an important part of it. I think this idea of crafting challenges where students have enough autonomy and play uh, that they can kind of uh, create with it, that it's not about just getting to one singular right answer all the time. I think that's that's uh, that's another thing. So this idea of like expressiveness. And then the last element of it that I think of is this idea of uh, audience and being able to share what you do with a, another person. It could just be like another, uh, like one of your classmates, but it's not just like a, like a solo exercise that you uh, do on your own, but it's about sharing it with, with, with an audience and then having, again, that kind of also strengthens the, the relevance angle as well. So to me, it's, it's, not, it's not so much whether the challenge is big enough, it's more about whether it has these elements that I've described in order to be uh, compelling for students and, and for them to want to engage with it. Interesting. Um, there's a couple of things to unpack here. The, the level of desirable difficulty uh, really brings to mind um, the work around the flow state. Um, yes. Extent behind is a work that when you're doing something that is below your ability, it's boring. And when you do something, I'm very much simplifying this. When you're doing something that's above your level, it's frustrating and you want to keep yourself in the middle, but we both know to learn something, you have to bump up against that, that frustration occasionally, because that's where you actually learn inside of the brain um, and connecting it to the emotion. Um, the, the other part is the, when you're talking about autonomy and play and sharing with others, it really made me think about um, some of the work around playful learning mm -hmm. and around how playful learning can help direct us away from just extrinsic motivation of being motivated by, I want to get good grades. I want to avoid my parents getting upset with me uh, and more into inter intrinsic motivation, which is these are actually going towards my goals and aspirations as a student. Does that resonate with you at all? It, it does. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, th I think that that's a really, um, that, that idea of play is really important. And I think um, it, you and I, Chris, have talked about this briefly in the past, but uh, that uh, I have this uh, um, kind of aversion to the word gamification. Mm -hmm. uh, not that not that it's the original intent of the word was bad, but I think it's the way that people interpret it as things like, uh, you know, leaderboards or points optimization or getting high scores. And, and I think what those things kind of miss is the the core idea of play and kind of like like creativity and play. Like it's more about the joyful play and coming up with something. Uh, that only you could have come up with, right? Versus like trying to get the uh, the top score in something, which again, like in a world of AI, that's the wrong game to be playing. Like that is something the the, the, AI, the AI will always beat you if 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 it's if it's a if it's a game where there's kind of a codified high score type of thing. That is a game that humans are going to lose anyways. And I'd argue that 
it, it, it was always the wrong thing to begin with. Like, I think it's more about what each person can like specifically bring to a situation and what is through that, uh, that joyful play, like how can they explore and find that? Nice. Let's shift gears a little bit. Yeah. There's so much new media that we have access to now. Um, sometimes when we think about the use of video in the classroom, we think about it as a one-way mechanic. Sometimes the teacher is working with one student on something and, and the other 29 students are watching a video, right? right. How do we right. get ourselves out of that paradigm and think about how we can really um, unlock video um, to really unlock student experience? Yeah, no, it's 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 a it's a really interesting question, and and I I like how you kind of highlight what um, kind of some of the current assumptions are around that. Uh, it's more about we think about video in uh, terms of like uh, I, I think about sort of the, the the point in time in which MOOCs were very popular, and the idea was that you know students could learn from world class instructors from around the world, and there's there's a lot of validity I think into into certain elements of that, but I think the part that is a really interesting mind shift is to say, what if we focus on video, not in terms of like what students consume, but in terms of what students create? How can we use video as a tool where like students are the ones who are creating the video? And so I'll, I'll give kind of two broad examples of uh, things that we do in, in our classes. Uh, one is we have, we use video a lot for really simple things like sharing um, like video reflections. So in, um, in addition to like writing reflections, we'll have students say like, okay, just record yourself for like 60 seconds and here, here's the prompt, offer your thoughts, don't overthink it, you know, just uh, kind of put that together. And then um, what's interesting is you get a very different valence of like what students share. Like there, you start to see like what they're excited by. You start to see like where they're uncertain. There's all these little like cues that come across in the video that you wouldn't get in, in a written piece. That say, said, there's like there's a value to like written reflections as well. I think, I think these are complementary, not, not substitutes. Uh, so I think like those kind of informal video shares, it could be reflections, it could be things like uh, introductions. We, we, I always have students do like video introductions uh, where they record themselves at the beginning of class. That, that's really helpful for students getting to know each other. Uh, we do uh, like these kind of video messages for expressing gratitude to your teammates. Uh, which is a really powerful exercise at, at like the the culmination of projects. So there's that element, and then the other part of video is like uh, students putting together a video in kind of edited pieces that they create. Um, I you know I've I've been experimenting with this like the last few years, and I, I used to be very paranoid about oh we're we giving students the tools to be able to put video together, and I'm finding more and more like uh, it people figure it out like and they. Like just if you've grown up with things like Instagram stories, you're already kind of like the idea of putting shot together with shot is um, you, you at least have kind of some starting points with that. So students being able to put together edited pieces where they uh, persuade and, and present, I think, is really interesting. And then uh, the last thing that I'll add is uh, actually coming back to the first one with with uh, video messages that students share. Uh, one thing that we do is we edit those pieces together. So we'll pull together kind of a summary of like reflections and insights and points. Uh, and then uh, video gives us the affordances to be able to um, kind of tightly synthesize those things together. And um, what I found particularly with uh, some of the more advanced readings that we were doing in design for learning, students said like, you know, throughout the course, the, the thing that was most helpful was seeing an edit, like um, people's reflections edited together. And that helped uh, students like make more sense of the, the academic paper than the paper itself did. Because often academic papers are written in the academic style and having, uh, being able to do that and then also activating the social brain with having like different points of view and all those different things. Um, that was a really exciting application. Uh, currently I edit those things in Adobe Premiere and I know that that's not a super accessible uh, program for a lot of people, but more and more we're seeing you now like text-based editors. So you can edit video as if you're editing a Google Doc. And I think we're not that far off from the point where we'll have video editing that's kind of like a chat GPT or DALI interface where I could say like, okay, make a video five minutes long with eight students, 15 seconds each, and only use students that haven't already been in edited videos this quarter. Like I think, I actually think we're, we're not that far away from that, but I think 
I think if we're ready with like, how would, what would we, what would we want to do with that? Like, and how would we want to kind of weave student voices together? I think that's, what's really, really exciting. You know, I want to ask a follow-up that really gets to the core of what I think happens inside of a classroom. The technology students will figure out, the context we can add for them. Um, but, but a big thing about sharing, especially with younger students, is around trust. Yes. How do we build that initial trust that's needed for students to really feel comfortable with sharing? Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, that question, Chris, because I think that is, um, to me, like the first week of a class is so critical for a week, week or two weeks. And I think in order to build trust, um, you, you have to create an environment where people are, um, I don't have a really good term for this, but it's kind of like you're kind of wading them into the waters of vulnerability where they're being vulnerable. And then when they're vulnerable, they feel a sense of being seen and heard and like that they are like, it, it's almost like um, uh, showing that, showing them that uh, this is a safe environment and like you can try something, you can share something, and then it's not a big deal if you share something. So let me give you a concrete example just to just to kind of ground this. Um, when students do introductions in 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 class, like um, I'll have them do uh, this is like a sort of a typical video introduction. Uh, you know, they'll do like name. Uh, you know, what, what field they're studying, uh, what city they were born in or something like that. And then I'll throw in a question that has like this kind of mild vulnerability added into it. Uh, but it's, it's, re it's really pretty tame. Uh, but like a really common one that I use uh, is, uh, what's one thing about you that most of your friends don't know about you? You know, it, 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 it's kind of like a, almost like a sort of a stupid sounding question. Like it's not like whatever, but then it kind of gets people like, oh, and then they share something. And then other people kind of, you know, learn about it. Um, and then they, they think it's like really weird. And a lot of people are like, oh yeah, that's cool that like, you know, that you, um, you know, you uh, like to take pictures of pine cones or something like that. Like that's, that's, <laughs> but it, it's like those little things can kind of scaffold up to like bigger uh, pieces of risk taking and vulnerability and safety. But it's important that you scaffold those so you're not, you're, you're, you're not starting with like trust falls on day one or something like that, uh, but you're starting with like these little bits of vulnerability, but you're structuring those, those bits of vulnerability in ways that get people get feedback that make them feel comfortable with, with, uh, with being vulnerable and feeling safe. And then, uh, you know, creating, uh, it's also important to create like, you know, ground rules, community agreements and all that stuff. But I think um, the key thing is for people to experience it in kind of doses and then that's what really leads to like a ladder of, of, of like safety, vulnerability, risk taking, and for people to go way beyond what they previously thought they'd be comfortable with. D does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so for our final question, I want you to go big. Um, yeah. Where do you see the future of education going? Yeah, it's, it's a really inter interesting question like uh, more and more uh, you know, starting to get into experimentation around um, use of generative AI in education. And I think, but I think it kind of leads back to what, something that I said previously. It's, I, th I think the big idea in education is more and more will be, um, we'll kind of have to focus on what are skills and mindsets and ways that we can achieve that are inherently human. Things that are like highly codified, um, you know, things that like uh, basically, if you could write a manual for for doing it, like that's probably something that an AI is going to be able to do it better anyway. And so, I think these skills of being able to to socially connect with each other, these skills of like empathy, uh, these skills of um, kind of noticing less from a pattern recognition kind of standpoint, but more from a uh, being able to see like these kind of um, variations and things, being able to kind of remix ideas in, in, in creative ways. I think that's where the future of education is because honestly, like a lot of the other things that um, if, if an AI agent is going to be able to do it better, then why should we have students uh, you know, spend a lot of time on that? Because it's kind of a, it's sort of a dead end for them other than to understand how it works so that you're able to kind of interact with it intelligently. Um, 
I think that's important, but I think it's really that human layer that um, in, in my most kind of optimistic uh, times, like I, I think of it, the future of education in terms of human terms. So one thing that I'm not sure that our audience um, really has a big grasp on is, is thinking about remixing ideas in creative ways. Could you, there's several things, can you break that down, what you mean by remixing, what kind of ideas that you might mean, and, and maybe a creative way that students could do that? Yeah, I think I think having like these, there are so many things in creativity that are, um, it's like the power of uh, juxtaposing like two, you know, two things that you didn't think went together. So we, 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 we take them for granted, but things like um, uh, Reese's peanut butter cups, you know, like chocolate and peanut butter on, on, on the, on the surface of it sounds like, doesn't sound, um, may have not sounded good before, but now it's kind of this common thing or, or to take like a, like a, um, a less common food example, uh, that one of my, my interns years ago, uh, kind of swore by, I've actually never tried it, but I should try it. She said, the best thing you could try with peanut butter is peanut butter and pickle. So try peanut butter and pickle sandwiches. I know that's, that's the reaction that I had. I was kind of like, ah, I don't know about that, but it, but I'm, I'm using that as a metaphor. Like, what are the peanut butter and pickle sandwiches out there that that uh, that you haven't tried yet? Like, what are things we're like? What if we made? Um, what if we thought about like how we use AI in terms of, of how can we use that to facilitate more um, uh, like uh, human connections between people? Like that. That's kind of like a kind of a uh, like a, a remix idea where you're you're kind of taking these two these two tensions. Uh, um, spoiler alert, that's actually what my class in fall is probably going to be about, but, but like, it's taking these, these things that don't seemingly go together and trying to combine them. And then, uh, that's one form of remixing is to take these kind of, uh, disparate things. You know, what if we, um, what if we took like heavy metal sounds and applied them to hip hop? Uh, you know, that, that at a certain point in time, people would have thought that was crazy. And then now, now that's almost like old hat, right? Like we're, but but there there's always like these new combinations that that I think um, uh, that humans will have an advantage with in terms of kind of thinking about things that haven't already been done uh, because they'll also be able to find like kind of what resonates uh, in in interesting ways. So what I'm hearing from you is that um, sometimes it helps to take two different ideas. Um, knowing, understanding that they might create discord and chaos, mm -hmm. but the discord and the chaos is the point because you want to see not only the new ideas that come from it, but the process of students experiencing that process of that discord and chaos, kind of that friction of those two ideas. Is, is that, is that right? That's yeah. Yeah. Ha having, having things that are intention or things that have seemingly nothing to do each other with each other and making those uh, potential connections and making a bunch of them too. It's not so much, again, it's not that there's one right answer. It's that there's, you know, probably 20 things you can think of in terms of what you could do with, with uh, peanut butter and pickles. Um, like maybe you could use peanut butter and pickles to like, as a way of um, uh, moving a heavy box, you know, or something, something, something like that. that, that I'm having trouble imagining the exact thing about that. But I think, it's those unexpected connections and playing with them and seeing like what are the different things that you can do with them because I think that level of originality will be an enduring human capability uh, even in an age of AI because uh, AI is really good at um, one at things that have already been done and being able to kind of find those those things and it, to a certain extent. Uh, with Dali and other things, you can have like interesting combinations. But in terms of like putting together disparate ideas, I think that's something that humans will always have like a, a special capability around. Interesting. Glenn, we've come to the end of our available time today. This has been really inspiring for me. And I wanted to thank you again for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I also wanted to thank again Digital Media Academy for sponsoring this series. You can find out more about Digital Media Academy for Schools program on the website at digitalmediaacademy.org forward slash schools, or you can contact us anytime at info at digitalmediaacademy.org. And our next speaker series session is going to be a conversation with Victor Lee, 
who's an associate professor at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. And he also leads the Data Interactions and in STEM Teaching and Learning Lab. It's gonna be a great conversation. On behalf of Digital Media Academy, I wanna thank everyone who's able to join us today for this session. We wish you a fantastic rest of your day. Take care. Thank you so much.